the Houston Philosophical Society at Rice University. At the opening of the Rice Institute in 1912, now Rice University, its first president, Edgar Odell Lovett, made clear its obligation to spread new learning in literature, science, and arts to the citizens of Houston, not just its enrolled students. That goal was extended in January 1920 when several faculty members organized the Houston Philosophical Society to bring together monthly faculty and civic leaders in science, medicine, the law, and humanistic disciplines for dinners and for lectures on the newest developments in those fields and others. Today, this organization continues to serve as a knowledge accelerator. It brings the latest ideas and discoveries to an intellectually curious membership through the form of popular and accessible lectures. Since 1927, the Society has met at the Cohen House Faculty Club on the Rice University campus, and it still reaches out to the broader Houston community and its various academic institutions for new members who are excited about sharing innovative ideas across the spectrum of professions and learned disciplines. This Town Gown Society sought to engage both academic leaders and various civic leaders in exploring the world of ideas, the thought being that such interaction could enrich the lives of all participants. For over a century, these meetings have expanded friendships and broadened the perspectives of the members of the Houston Philosophical Society.
and we narrowed it down to the 10 best. We thought the best, and we interviewed all 10 of those uh, over a period of days in New York at the American, American uh, Historical Association meeting. And then from those, that top 10, we identified the ones we thought were clearly the three best. And we brought each of those three best to the campus for about a two or three day visit. When they, they have a chance to meet with every member of the faculty, to have a meal with everybody, and uh, to meet with the dean, and to give a lecture. And I want to say at the beginning of this search, we, our, our uh, aspiration was to hire the very best new young historian in South Asia available in the world. And we knew that, you know, that obviously we wanted a person who would have absolutely first-rate scholarship. Because even though, in theory, when you're hiring somebody brand new like that, you can give them a, a two or three year contract. But you also know that six years from that date, tenure, tenure decision comes up. And the tenure decision, the scholarship has to be better than first rate. Because we will send letters around to the eight or 10 premier scholars in that field in the world to ask for detailed evaluations of that person's work. And so when we, we're hiring a person for, for now, what we're really thinking six years down the road, we don't, be, we don't want to be faced with the idea that somebody we really like and respect, we can't keep. You know, the scholarship is not right. So we, we really look at the scholarship. It was clear on reading uh, Lisa's scholarship that that would be fine. But we're also looking for a person we can live with. We want a good colleague, a kind of, you know, a, a, a good citizen, a person who will serve on committees and so forth. But we also want somebody who will be a really good teacher. Now I have to admit, Scholarship account means everything. But we want people who also can be really good teachers. Well, so the three people come down, and even though I was on the committee, we had to read most of the material, and we met each person. And when Lisa gave her talk, I walked out and said, well, there's our person. Here's a person who more than meets our expectations for scholarship, and for being a sort of community university citizen, and for being a good teacher. Well, here it is. I don't know, 15 or 16 years later, and um, I'll just kind of look at some of the things here. In 2012, her first book was published, Imperial Identity in the Mughal Empire, Memory and Dynastic Politics in an Early Modern South and Central Asia. That's a good start. And then, a few years later, the Emperor Jahangir, Power and Kingship in Mughal India. Uh, it was a financial times this book, summer book in 2020. Uh, then there's another book, almost published, will be published in, in 2024, called Comparative Imperial Pleasure Gardens or World History. And then in addition to those three books, she's published a number of articles and uh, chapters in books and encyclopedia pieces and so forth. So here's a person who clearly is a first rate scholar. Uh, she's given lectures all over the United States, she's been much in London and in Turkey and in India, uh, so she is really well known in the field. She is very active on committees, serving the university in a whole variety of ways. She also has won the Brown Award for Superior Teaching, the Brown Award for Teaching Excellence, and again the Brown Award for Superior Teaching, and she was winner of the Rice University Academic Advising Award, and she was winner in 2010 the Phi Beta Kappa Award for Teaching Excellence. So here's a person, absolutely first rate scholarship, of impeccable teaching. And she also serves the university in so many ways. She gives, she's given classes at the Guy Scott School. She's uh, been involved in the Master of Liberal Studies program, uh, directing students at the Guy Scott School. And uh, something is dear to my heart, she play, played a very big role in <coughs> lecture tours for the traveling gals. So, my Alumni Association. And uh, if I've been involved in that too, so I hear people talking about these Rice Chapel programs. And I have to say that within a few years, everybody realized that Lisa was legendary <laughs> as a tour director. And, uh, so here's the person I think, you know, we had great aspirations in 2006 of hiring somebody who would be what I call a sort of service <coughs> professor who could teach and could serve and could. And to, and could publish. And uh, and Lisa, we struck a home run, or maybe three home runs. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce 
my friend, colleague. She is Joseph and Joanna Nashville Bullitt Professor of Humanities. She's the chair of the Department of Transnational Asian Studies, and she's the director of the Chow Center for Asian Studies. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Bullitt-Angelar. PhD in 2007, so I was quite a bit older than my cohort, and I interviewed with Rice, and I walked out of the interview and said to my husband, if they offer me a job, that's where I'm going, and he said, we're not moving to Texas, and I said, honey, we're moving to Texas because those are the most fabulous people I've met. Uh, that interview was like the best dinner party I'd ever been to in my life. Uh, it was extraordinary. So uh, it's my great good fortune to be at Rice, and I have loved it every minute that I've been here. Uh, so thank you, and my wonderful colleague, John Bowles, has always been such a welcoming presence. So, okay, this is a little too close, maybe. <laughs> it's okay, all right. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Kathleen, so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, Kathleen had asked that I talk about the new Department of Transnational Asian Studies for a bit, so if you don't mind, I'd like to start with that, because I know myself and I may run out of time. I'm hoping Kathleen will give me the big signal. Oh gosh, this microphone's very really loud. Um, but I want to make sure to get that some time. So if you don't mind, I'll start with the discussion of the new department. Um, okay. Clicker is plugged in, but not working. Where's my tech guy? Uh, sometimes you need to point it at the thing. remind me that it was going to take a minute to switch to the next slide. It's not happening. Oh. Okay. No? I'll do it for you. Sorry. Okay, thank you. I don't know why it's not working. It seemed to be. Okay. Well, meanwhile, we're looking at the cover of the second book, which is... There we go. All right. So um, the department has been a long time birthing. Um, it was actually a program that uh, began in the 80s when Richard Smith, who was our historian of China, began to uh, arrange a major in Asian studies at Rice. Um, so he ran this program for quite some time, and then in 2008, the Chow family extremely generously offered uh, an endowment to support the Center um, for Asian Studies, the Chow Center for Asian Studies. Not loud enough? Okay, how's this? Okay, sorry, I'm angling my head. Uh, so the Chow Center was founded in 2008, just a year after I arrived at Rice. And so I am the third director of the Chow Center, but it was a few years ago that our Dean of Humanities, Kathleen Cannon, decided that the Chow Center just wasn't making enough of an impact on campus um, or in the field of Asian studies. And she felt that the really, uh, the big power centers on campus were actually academic departments, not research centers. So she, uh, um, agreed to turn the Chow Center into a department, an academic department, 
uh, and uh, I've seen her. So mm -hmm. she created the new department, of uh, Transnational Asian Studies, based on Rich Smith's original idea of exploring an Asia that was not focused on individual nation states. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, having taken over this new department, I came in in 2020 when it was founded. She asked me to become the chair. And she scraped together faculty from across campus that worked in Asian studies that perhaps did not have an academic home that made much sense. So we adopted historians of literature and art history and a few public political science and anthropology people. So we immediately began creating a department that was multidisciplinary and across schools. I think we are the only major at Rice that, allow, that includes classes in the social sciences and humanities in the same degree program. Um, but the other very exciting thing that happened right away was that I was told I could go ahead and hire a few new faculty using the same exact process that John just described. Um, and we were able to actually bring three new faculty to campus to join the new department. Um, and it was very exciting. And there's, turning out to be fabulous scholars, fabulous teachers, great human beings. Um, so the, right now we have eight faculty in the department, but we also uh, include classes that are taught by affiliated faculty across campus. So from a variety of departments, uh, people in history, in philosophy, in religious studies, in anthropology, who teach classes with Asia content, their classes can count towards the major in Asian studies. Um, so we have the bachelor's degree, we now offer a minor. The difference is that for the, for the bachelor's degree, we're one of only two majors on campus that require fluency in foreign language. It's no longer a thing, but it is for us, because of course it has to be in Asian studies. So the major requires uh, Asian language. We have Chinese, Korean, <coughs> Japanese, and Arabic on campus. Um, and the minor does not require a language because this is making things accessible to students in engineering or in pre-med who just love the subject matter but cannot commit to three or four years of language study. So it's becoming really popular uh, and our graduates in Asian studies have already gone off to pretty illustrious careers. We have a long record of Asian studies majors going to London School of Economics or Harvard Law. We, we produce a lot of lawyers. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, a lot of people in State Department, civil service, um, uh, public policy. It was a really great major, and we are very humble, and we recognize that it's not a primary major for most students, that it's going to be secondary to whatever else they want to do. So we patch it together with poli sci or history or pre-med um, or architecture or uh, any number of things. But we have a couple of musicologists as well. Okay, can we? Very much. So, and is the sound okay for you now? All right. So, I, I want to explain what we mean by transnational Asia because this is super confusing. We're the only department in the country that describes itself this way. And it is because we are working in, in, in research and teaching in ways that are not bounded by country borders or nation states. The, the scholars in the department work on the movement of ideas and technologies, sometimes people, sometimes armies, um, religions, philosophies. As these things move, they are not contained within nations. So our focus as researchers is on these uh, migratory, movements of ideas and technologies, which is going to lead me to talk about my own work in a minute. Um, so when I look at a map of transnational Asia, it does look like this. It actually encompasses the globe, and it contains no borders. We have scholars in our department who work on things like 19th century Japanese immigration to Brazil and the US and the Caribbean. Right? How do you encompass that within borders? We have a scholar who works on Tibetan Buddhism, but he works on Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet and Vietnam and Mongolia. You can't fit it within borders. 
so these are the scholars that we've brought in to teach students at RISE. And I think it's very exciting that everyone I work with in my department is engaged with ideas that have this kind of global impact. So my own work uh, hopefully has some global impact. Uh, what I really focus on in both of my books and in all of my research is the, the narrowest way of putting it is Turkish kingship. I work on Turkish kingship. Um, my Turks are not in Anatolia. They're in Central Asia. Um, and they migrate across Asia and settle in places like what is now Uzbekistan, which is the heartland of the dynasty I work on. Some will move on into Anatolia and uh, the Middle East. My guys, my guys, <laughs> I do call them my guys, <laughs> will migrate from Central Asia down into India in the 16th century. So I'm tracking Turks, but I'm tracking Muslim, Turkish, semi-nomadic equestrian warriors in Hindu India. You see, this, there's nothing boundaries can give us here. This is all about the movement of ideas. Um, so who are the Mughals? Uh, I think most of you probably know the Taj Mahal or have visited the Taj Mahal. It's built by my dynasty. I am very possessive. I <laughs> my boys built that gorgeous thing. Um, that was the fifth Mughal emperor who built it, Shah Jahan. Um, but in their origins, they are descendants of the greatest empire builders in Central Asian history, Genghis <coughs> Khan and Tamerlan. They're direct descendants of both of those dynasties. So that is the Turkish and the Mongol, Genghis Khan being Mongol royalty, his, his lineage after his death, his genealogy is all going to be Central Asian nobility. They're all princes and princesses, and they identify as such. And in fact, after his death, kingship isn't considered legitimate in Central Asia unless you are a descendant of that dynasty. Until the rise of Tamerlane in the 14th century, who is a Turk, who is able to create an empire almost the same size as Genghis Khan's. And so from his death in 1405 forward, Legitimate kingship in Central Asia is Tamerlane's dynasty or Genghis Khan's dynasty, or hopefully both. Well, here we have both. We have people from both royal families intermarrying, and their offspring are the ones who will now conquer in northern India and establish the Mughal dynasty. That's quite an inheritance. Um, as kings in India, uh, their, their genealogy is their main source of power and, and the arguments they make for kingship. So we see a lot of these genealogical paintings yeah, or, or writings in their uh, work. This one, for example, has Tamerlane in the center. And then all the generations of his sons and the Mughal emperors, oddly skipping many generations in the middle, right? Um, if I can get this to... Yeah, and here's Jahangir here. Okay. So they will, they are in Samarkand, in what is Uzbekistan now, initially. They're driven out by another Mongol uh, tribal confederation, pushed into Afghanistan where they settle in Kabul for about 20 years. And it's from Kabul that they start raiding south and end up conquering northern India in 1526. So this is the actual founder of the dynasty, and I would like to point out, I wish I had actually given you the whole painting, because he's a delicate little figure, sitting in a chair, reading a book. And it tells you everything you need to know about my boys. <laughs> They're highly literate. They're very sensitive. They see themselves as intellectual elites. Uh, Babur, Zahir Adin Muhammad Babur is his name. Uh, and again, descended on both sides from Central Asian royalty. He sees himself as a new Timur. He conquers northern India. He hates India. Too hot, terrible melons, as we discussed earlier. But he recognizes the potential for wealth and power, so he remains. Um, he's, a, he's a writer, though. He's a poet. He produces a massive amount of poetry. He's writing in Chagatai Turkish. 
uh, which is not a literary language in this moment. Most of his milieu, the elites of Central Asia, are using Persian. Farsi, same thing. He's trying to turn Turkish into a literary language, so he's writing poetry in both. But here's the coolest thing about Bakur, apart from his founding of an important empire, blah, blah, blah. He writes a memoir, which we call Bakur Nama, the story of Bakur. Probably the first memoir in Islamic history. It's not just a, a biography of somebody. You see those all the time in the Islamic world. Uh, and they tend to be very panegyric, kind of trope-ridden, um, rife with symbols of a certain kind of personality or presentation. Bakur writes his own memoir, and he describes his feelings. He talks about himself as a really idiosyncratic person. And at one point, he's in love with a boy in the bazaar, also named Bakur, and he has, expresses longing. Nothing happens, you know, but he's like, that boy is so cute. A 16th century Central Asian Turkish prince. Uh, at one point, he loses a battle and he weeps and he says, I'm crying because I screwed it up so badly and I should have done this and I did that. And, you, know, you see this real personality emerge. Um, so the, the memoir is written for a very specific mm -hmm. reason. Not only is he highly literate and, uh, and a writer and the and the image shows us that he is remembered that way by his descendants. This painting is actually from the 16th century. I'm sorry, yeah, late 16th century. But he's writing it to differentiate himself from the other Timurid Mughal princes around him. The uh, succession practices in this community suggest that every male member of the dynasty has an equal right to contest the throne. All of your cousins and brothers are your rivals for power. Usually that ends in a negotiation. Sometimes it ends in a succession war. Sometimes those wars can be very bloody and long. Bahur's memoir, I argue, is written to say, look, I'm different from these jerks around me. I, am, I deserve to be the new Timor for these reasons. And here we see the appearance of this very individual character for the, really the first time in Islamic history. Okay. Can we do the next? Mm -hmm. So his great-grandson is uh, going to be the emperor Jahangir. His birth name is Sayan, but he'll take the name Jahangir when he achieves the throne. Jahangir is made of two Turkish words. Jahan is the world. Gir mek, to seize hold of. Jahangir, he who seizes hold of the world. He who conquers the world. So it's a regnal name. Um, what makes Jahangir very exciting for me is several things, and this is why the book. He's very understudied. Um, his father was Akbar the Great. It's hard to be the son of, a, of a, the great, right? Um, conquered most of the empire that he would inherit. Really interesting intellectual, uh, famous all over the world. And then there's Jahangir, this kind of failed drunken son. And yes, drunken, he admits to alcoholism and opium addiction through his own memoir. But this is the point. He's going to write a memoir, too, just like Babur. And I, I think that two great models in his life are Babur and Akbar, his father, who he resents like hell, but admires profoundly. So he will write a memoir starting on the day he achieves the throne. We know he wrote it himself um, because not only does he describe the writing process, but others around him mention seeing the manuscript. He actually shows it to people periodically. He gives away copies of it 12 years in, one of which is in Istanbul right now. Right? He sees it as a model for kingship. He's going to give it to people to teach them how to be a good king, but it is, in fact, not a good model <laughs> because he is, of course, addicted to drugs and a bit of a mess, which to me makes him more interesting than most, right? This is an image of him holding a picture of his own father. The, the green ball that Akbar is holding is a representation of the globe. This is the 16th century. European globes have come to India. So the Mughals are very aware of this, and they use this representation all the time, and especially when your name is Jahangir, 
there's your globe, right? So he adopts a policy of veneration of his father after he takes the throne, but before that he'd been in rebellion and quite an awful son for a long time. So I just uh, hit a couple of themes in the book um, that come up a lot that I find personally really interesting. I love the personality of Jahan Beer. He is a mess, but he's a mess who's very self-aware and very engaged in the world and deeply curious. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, kind of a scientist and an artist and a thinker. And all of that shows up along with the alcoholism and the kind of whiny attitude, um, which women learn to put up with, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> why I'm living longer in that moment, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I want to talk about religion because this is something that I think surprises people about the Mughals. They are Sunni Muslims. Turks are Sunni Muslims. They, they're going to convert in Central Asia in the 19th and 10th centuries, um, gradually, it's not a forced conversion. They've been migrating west just as the Arabs uh, uh, come out of the Arabian Peninsula and expand into Sassanid Iran and expand into Central Asia, bringing these Arab military outposts that, that settle near the Turkic tribal regions and conversion happens, right? It's great work done on why, and it's very interesting. Um, what is really important to know, though, is that as this conversion is happening in Central Asia, there, are, there is a profound influence of devotional piety in Islam in that particular historical moment. From about the second century after the founding of Islam, we see the emergence of Sufis, devotional figures, they're individuals, who make the argument that while being a loyal Muslim, what's really most important is to, is to show love of God. There's a wonderful poet in 17th, in 7th century, um, I'm sorry, 8th century Syria, Rabia, who writes, if I love God for fear of hell, send me to hell. If I love God with, with the idea of paradise, don't let me get to paradise. You have to love God for the sake of God. And this begins to be the Sufi doctrine. It's called the doctrine of Ishq or Ash. If you speak Persian or French, you know that word. What's really interesting about that word, though, is it doesn't mean a kind of benevolent love. Ishq is the word you hear on Turkish radio in pop music. That's sex, that's romance, that's passion. So when you talk about the doctrine of Ishq, you're talking about a passionate adoration of God that is all-consuming, right? It's not about love, it's about passion. So as devotional Sufism moves across the Islamic world, it's emerging in Central Asia in some very powerful threads in the 9th and 10th centuries. And move, whole movements are founded around it, in which Sufi masters develop strategies for, um, for their followers to help them achieve that moment of unity with God that they're all searching for. It's called fana, annihilation of the self in love of God. Right? So some of them twirl, some of them chant, right? and the, this is devotionalism in Islam. So as the Turks and Persians are converting to Islam, it's under these influences that they become Muslims. What it means for us is that their acceptance of Islam, their loyal adherence to Islam, is in many ways grounded in the concept of um, Islamic identity as non-doctrinal, as non-legalist, as malleable, as passionate, right? So, it should not then surprise you that in the 16th century in India, my boys, Sunni Muslim Turks, are arriving and saying, like, Hindu's cool, like, Jainism is cool. And uh, this is what Akbar is most famous for, really, is, is not just a tolerance of, of other religions, a passionate curiosity about them. So he will gather adherents of the variety of religions in his palace regularly and ask them to debate questions with him about this, the nature of God and the universe. And there's not a, a, an oppression of any 
uh, particular religion in Mughal India, Jahangir will adopt the same strategy. Um, one of the British visitors to his royal court, Edward Terry, who's actually a minister, who's come to be the, the um, uh, you know, the, in, uh, the caregiver of the British, the first British ambassador to India, which is the same period, 1616 16 through 18. He says, you know, you come to the royal court, you talk to the ruler, at this point it's Jahangir, he says, every man has liberty to profess his own religion. This is not happening in England in the 16th and 17th centuries. And even dispute with theirs with impunity. You can fight with them about their religion, and they're not going to get upset about it, right? So we have this really interesting, complex understanding of religion and politics in this moment that allows for a dynasty of Sunni Turks to rule a conquest territory that is majority Hindu. It's not even a monotheist state like the Ottomans are dealing with in Anatolia. Oh no, <laughs> not that easy. And yet they decide they won't tax non-Muslims in India. Right? They're going to accept <coughs> religious practice. And within this dynasty, there will be multiple books written about how Sufism and Vedanta are the same thing, really, because it's all about devotion to God. So Jahangir writes a lot about visiting um, uh, Hindu mystics in the desert. And this one, Jadrupa goes, goes saying he visits multiple times. He lives in a hole in the ground. Jahangir describes him coming out of the hole like a worm. But he, Jahangir says he's the wisest person of his time I've ever known. And I come to him for advice. The Hindu mystic. As you can see, I've shown you lots of Mughal paintings. Um, so Jahangir is known for the paintings produced at his royal court under his direction. He's very involved in the production of artwork. Um, and I think there's a, a surprise among people to realize that my Muslim Turks are doing a lot of portraits of people. And the expectation is that in Islam, there is no figural imagery. And I'm here to say that that's not at all true. In fact, in any case, not necessarily only among my boys, but across the Islamic world, there are very few regions where it is suppressed. It is a conversation people are having with Safavids in Iran, the Ottomans in Turkey. They're going to go through phases where they're like, is this cool? I don't think it's cool. Maybe it's OK. It's contested all the time. Um, but it's not against the law in Islam. And it's certainly in the Turkish and Persian world, we have a lot of portraiture over the entire uh, history of Islam. So the Mughals, and especially under Jahangir, are fascinated by mimetic imagery. Paintings of animals, the landscape, and people that are intensely realistic. And the goal in Jahangir's period is to have things be as realistic as possible. So we end up with this extraordinary portraiture. And maybe by now you can recognize him when you see him, right? With his curly sideburns and his pearl earrings. Um, and you begin to know their faces. By the end of his reign, so important is it that individual portraits be correct that even the names of the person are written across them on the paintings. It's more important to disturb the viewer's gaze with that writing than to have them miss the point of who this exactly is. So the question is why this obsession with uh, mimetic exactitude. And so the Mughal writings do describe portraiture as a, as a memorialization. So remembering the past and keeping in mind that their power is driven by their adherence to this lineage of kings, right? So this identity, this genealogy is everything. Um, so memorializing the individuals of that genealogy are very important. And you see a lot of historical portraits which couple to, or group together six or eight or ten generations uh, in a single painting. But also there's an argument made that this 
offers a certain immortality and may even bring people uh, back to life in a sense, right? Um, this painting in particular um, is a woman at the Mughal court holding a portrait of Jahangir. It's a nice little um, uh, weird episode. Um, she's often described as his wife, Noor Jahan, who was quite famous queen of India. She's a very powerful wife. But in fact, I would argue this could not be Noor Jahan because her nipples are showing and you would not have an elite royal woman painted in this way. It has to be one of the serving girls. The painting during Jahangir's period gets really wild. There are, there's a whole series of genre paintings that, that we call Jahangir's dreams or the allegorical paintings of Jahangir. And these are, these are the places where he is most comfortable kind of portraying himself as a divine king. Um, he's not really good at it in real life because he is a drunk, but in a, in a static painted image, he could be everything he dreamed of. One of his most famous paintings is called Jahangir preferring a Sufi sheikh to kings. And of course, as you can see, we have, well, this is the Ottoman Sultan Selim at the top, and that's um, King James of England it, who's con it, in that period. And this is the actual painter, Vichitik. Um, the painter's often still a little self-portrait. Um, notice the cherubim and seraphim. They're, at this point, the Mughals have found European painting, and European visitors know that if you want to bring a cool present to the king, it's going to be one of these European paintings because he's obsessed with them. He wants his painters to imitate them, and they're playing with forms all the time. They're borrowing from Rajput painting styles, from um, uh, Bengali painting styles, European painting styles, Persian. Turkish, they're mashing it all together just the way they want it. So you see a lot of cherubim in uh, Mughal paintings. Um, can we go to the next? I want to show you the, how critically important mimetic uh, portraiture is. So this is the Mughal painting of James. This is a bridge painting of James, which the Mughals probably had a copy of because you can see it's almost identical. Um, it's, it's just so unusual in the Islamic world to have this degree of concern about accuracy and portraiture. I want to go to the next one here to show you another example. This is the Safavi Iranian Shah, Shah Abbas. Very powerful. He's been king a lot longer than Jahangir. They're intense rivals. But they also identify as kind of brothers. Culturally, they share a great deal. They're exchanging embassies all the time, and we have these incredible descriptions of elephants and camels laden with jewels and fabrics and fabulous things. And Jahangir said strange creatures to Iran, and the Iranians said gorgeous fabrics to India. But Jahangir has himself painted with Shah Abbas on several occasions. They are never actually in the same room in their lifetime. This is one of the allegorical paintings. But you can see that Shah Abbas did not come across that well in these paintings. He's, still, he's small, he's kind of shriveled. Look, he's the one standing on the land. Not <laughs> here's the one standing on the line, on the, on the world, right? But Jahangir explains in his own memoir that he has sent his own court painters to Iran to do exact portraits of this Shah, bring them back to make sure that the Shah's portrayal in the Indian portraits is exact. So even though he looks like he's kind of being made fun of. OK, this is an Iranian portrait of Shah Abbas. This is, in, this is a part of a mural that Shah Abbas built at the Chihil Sutun Palace in Isfahan. So you can see, in fact, it's a real portrayal. It's not just some kind of uh, mockery of the Safavid Shah. One of the things I study a lot in my work on Jahangir is his change in the style of the royal court to a more peripatetic, mobile court culture. 
They will create a, uh, a court progress, it's called. But by the, by the middle of Jahangir's reign, he is so mobile that he does not remain in the capital city for any length of time for the rest of his life. He loves to travel across his conquest <coughs> territories with a massive entourage that often includes his entire army, all of the support staff, the elephants. So we have Europeans who witness it and we get the descriptions from them of this massive collection of people. Why would you be peripatetic? And, you know, they're descendants of the semi-nomadic Turks and Mongols, so perhaps a reference to the past. In Hindu kingship, there is an ancient Vedic scripture that asks that the, the Rajas perform what is called a Digvijaya, a, a, a journey to the four quarters of their kingdom on a regular basis in order to claim status as a Chakravarti, a wheel-turning ruler. So there are, there's a lot of support for the concept of imperial mobility in India. My argument is that Jahangir just enjoys it. He's using those excuses because what he really wants is to camp out, go fishing, smoke pot, get drunk, and um, not have the pressures of palace life, right? So the European observers describe this extraordinary uh, 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 witness this, this retinue of Thomas Rowe, the first British ambassador, estimates at least 600,000 in one episode. His pastor, Terry, says it took 12 hours for it to pass him as he stood in one place. Rowe and Terry travel with Jahangir on the court progress for two years um, through areas of Gujarat and uh, to the west, with, um, and they complained bitterly. It's terrible. Uh, Thomas Rowe says, uh, the people following this king blasphemed his name. Jahangir's having a blast. His <laughs> memoir is full of, I saw this beautiful place on the banks of an irrigation stream, on the banks of a river, on the banks of a lake. We're camping here for three days because it is so beautiful. I called for a wine party. <laughs> this is why I think rice students like to hunt so so much. <laughs> and what I, what I see is Jahangir taking this kind of political, philosophical support for a court progress and turning it into a pursuit of pleasure. But in so doing, as the Mughals uh, remain intensely mobile, they fall passionately in love with the South Asian landscape. So from Babur's earlier complaining that it's not pretty, that there's no culture, he says it's too, there are no candles, there are no baths, it's a terrible place, to Jahangir's time with, and, and his son Shah Jahan, who travel constantly and say, if there is a paradise on the face of the earth, this is it. <laughs> I don't know how much time I'm doing for time. Um, like maybe five minutes more and then we'll take some questions. Okay. So I won't get to everything I plan to get to, but and you can tell already, can't you, that I could talk for days and I would join you now. So I'm really glad like, Kathleen is going to cut me off. Um, one of the reasons that Jahangir finds such pleasure in movement is because it allows him to hunt almost daily. Hunting is a really important part of the culture. This is from the turco mongol past. It remains so in India. They, in fact, uh, use the uh, Mongol circle hunt a lot of the time, which can involve, again, this retinue of tens of thousands, creating a vast circle around miles of landscape, and then slowly leading inwards so that the animals are trapped in the center. Uh, and then, it's not very gentlemanly, is it? Then the king goes in and the elites go in and kill everything they want to kill. And then when they're done, the next level of nobility is on and on and on. Most of the meat supports the mobile court progress. They do not, in fact, um, uh, despoiling the countryside or expecting local landowners to support them. They have a system that feeds this group as they travel. It's really remarkable, very unusual. 
And he's obsessed with hunting. And the one animal he doesn't allow anyone else to kill is lions, because of course, masculinity, right? He's the only one who's allowed to kill scary lions. So if anyone has a lion ravaging their village or their, their neighborhood, they have to call the emperor to come out and kill the lion. And at one point, he's quite busy. So he gets a request to kill a lion and sends his son, who will be Shah Jahan, to kill the lion, and the son comes home with the lion, John Beer, who is such a whiny baby, says in his memoir, oh, yeah, I saw, look, it looked bigger when it was alive, but now that it's dead, I can see it was pretty small, pretty <laughs> big, but not very important. Um, I, I would like to point out, too, that as hunting companions, we have images of him here with his trained lion and his trained cheetahs, who will go with him uh, on all of his hunts, the cheetahs are actually given titles of the nobility if they are successful hunters, and they wear jeweled collars, and they have their own handlers. They write quite a lot about this. And Jahangir is very happy because he actually is able to establish a breeding program for cheetahs, which even today is very hard to do. This we struggle with this. Um, so he writes about that. Um, so let me just talk finally about um, his relationship with the natural world and his curiosity and his joy in it. I don't think historians talk enough about joy. Um, Jahangir is somebody who is a very emotional person and, and because of the memoir we have access to his, his moods in a lot of ways and there is so much passionate attention to the landscape and to the creatures of South Asia. And as he travels, he has his court painters with him and he'll tell them, paint this, paint that. He's illustrating the Jahangir Nama, his book, The Story of Jahangir, through this. So he's, uh, he's thrilled by strange and obscure things. He has uh, agents stationed at the court, at the ports like in Goa, when the Portuguese ships come in. His agents get first pick of what's coming off the boat. So what does he end up with? It's a North American turkey. This is painted at Jahangir's court, and he describes it in his memoir. So Jahangir gives us this incredibly fabulous moment of overlapping text and image so much of the time. He writes about it, and then there's the paint. And of course, here's another one he writes about a lot. Wow. OK, well, I'm pointing at the zebra. <laughs> And he describes it. He says, the black and white stripes are as if God had handled the paintbrush. <laughs> He's thrilled. Of course, what's that at the top? It's an Englishman. <laughs> oh, equally weird. We have zebra and <laughs> <Turkey, laughs> Englishman, right? And this, of course, a dodo bird. And in fact, the painting is so perfect that scholars have decided it has to have been painted from life. And it is the last painting we have of a, of a living dodo bird mm -hmm. at the local port. So you can see the quality of the painting. It's when, when his painters are working on the animals and the landscapes of South Asia, A, it leaves us with an extraordinary record of early modern India. And B, this is um, a natural history that's just as good as anything Audubon gave us. Oh, I don't have time for this. <laughs> you are going to have to invite me again because marriage is just so interesting. <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't have time. I'm just going to have to leave it there. Oh, yeah, invite me again. We can do another slide. I, I think we, we can close this out. Yeah, so the point I, I make with Jahangir is the, is the complexity of his personality that even though his father is Akbar, and his son is Shah Jahan of the Taj Mahal, that he is equally an interesting and, and uh, extraordinary turko mongol ruler of the Hindu world. And his courtly culture teaches us a great deal about India, about kingship, about Islam. Finally, one of my favorite paintings, it's not as well done as others, but it's painted as he's coming into Kashmir, which is his favorite place in all of South Asia. He literally forces his retinue of tens of thousands over the icy 
peaks in the mountains in the spring, and they, they keep stopping and saying, it's not safe, we have to wait for the snow to melt. And the elephants are literally falling off the sides of the cliff. And he says, but if we wait, we'll miss the flowers blooming in the first spring weeks. So they go on. This is Jahangir. Right? I do want to point out the prow of his ship. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's an elephant. He's so charming. Um, so I like to call him the world's most elegant man. <laughs> So I think I will end there without uh, boring you with too much talk. You see why I love my guys. They're super interesting. I'd be really happy to take questions. Are there any questions? Oh, while we're waiting, I do want to point out the dragons represent, it's kind of a, uh, an inside joke. Each of the dragons is from a very different part of Asia, including India, Korea, Japan, and China. What uh, language of the text that you're talking about, written in, and how many of the languages do you know and read and write? Yeah, this is the painful question. Most of the work I do is in Persian, Persian. medieval Persian, handwritten manuscripts. Um, some Turkish, Babur's memoir was written in Turkish. Um, so I'm able to read that in the original. And then Jahangir and his period, everything was in Persian. And um, pretty simple, easy Persian, if there was such a thing. Um, I learned Persian in my 40s, so I'm already losing it again now. <laughs> Age is really a bitch. <laughs> um, but Turkish I learned much earlier, so that's sticking. Th those are my research languages. I studied, uh, I studied Arabic and French as well, um, but I don't use them for my research. Thank you. Was Shah Jahan his son, and did he feel an obligation as a father to bring him along and train him? Ooh, this is such a great question. I work on princely training a lot in my first book, if you're interested in checking that out. It's at the library, you don't have to buy it. Although they're both in paperback, so not in our book. Um, the problem we have here is the succession system, which says every male member of the family is the rival of the other. So once the princes are old enough to like move and walk and talk, they become a little dangerous. Um, they're all very highly educated. The girls are too. Uh, this is a, another Turco-Mongol legacy that women have a great deal of power and agency in this dynasty, elite women. Um, so they're all very well educated, and the princes will go to war with their with their fathers to learn how to manage the army. They govern provinces, so they learn how to manage a treasury and how to administer. But all of this is preparation for that moment when dad shows any sign of weakness. And then, like vultures, you're gonna figure out who gets to take the throne from him. Usually it's after he dies, but in fact, Shah Jahan doesn't die before his sons overthrow him. Um, but he deserved it, because he is a jerk. Really. <laughs> Shah Jahan was a terrible person. When he took the throne, he had all the male members of his immediate family killed because he wanted to avoid that rivalry. This is really common in the Ottoman context in Turkey, but never happens with the Mughals. He's the only one. Um, I went way off topic there. Um, yes, the sons are trained, but they're never considered safe companions. I had a couple of questions. One of them. You talk about Babur writing his memoirs. How did they publish mm -hmm. their memoirs? <laughs> the other question was, just the idea of how the halo in many of the oh, novels. Yes. Right. Um, can you talk about that? Yes. So they're not published, but scribes are making copies of them, as, as would have been the case in medieval Europe, right? So we have many copies, and they're all handwritten. And so you need to look at 30 copies and make sure that you're you know, not seeing the, the mistakes uh, as the true thing. You know, each of them might have a few mistakes, but they're not going to be the same mistakes. I don't work on that level. There's a wonderful Japanese scholar who's done the best version of the Babur Nama, um, and he's looked at every copy in the world and identified the absolute perfect text. The problem is it's in Chagatai Turkish and Japanese. <laughs> I, fortunately, I can do the Turkish, so it works out pretty well. Uh, so not published. The halos, 
Kahalas are really interesting, aren't they? So Akbar is going to make claims that he is a divine king. And he's pretty divine, in fact. <laughs> but he rules for 49 years, and his kind of model of kingship gets really well established. And he toys with all of these ideas and himself is what he calls himself as the universal arbiter to, uh, to uh, resolve any disputes globally um, and at his court. So you start to see images with halos pretty commonly, and then um, by the end of his reign, always. Jahangir, Shah Jahan, even Shah Jahan's much more conservative son, Aurangzeb, is portrayed with a halo. So it's become a sign of sacred kingship. But Jahangir doesn't actually make the claim that he is divine, but he does absolutely believe he's been divinely appointed. We've heard the term uh, Mughal in India many, many, many times. If you read a book on India, you read it, there's a presumption that you know what that, what that means, and they talk about all these different uh, 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 people. What exactly would you, how would you define it, A, geographically, B, uh, uh, chronologically, um, and now how did it have, uh, uh, pan out relative to the Muslim invasion, which was what, about 700 AD. Oh, so are you talking about the term, term Mughal? Well, I mean, what exactly is Mughal? Mughal, Mughal is a name given to this dynasty by the Portuguese, who identified them as Mongol. And so this is the Mughal word for Mongol. I mean, the Portuguese word for Mongol. So it started around 1450. Okay. It starts, yeah, well, they, they don't exist yet, but in the middle of the, of the 16th century, when they're in India, it's, uh, it's not until Akbar's time that they actually have contact with the Portuguese. And um, um, so this, the term um, Mughal is used for them. Their name for themselves is Timur. Oh, it's most of India, ultimately. I mean, this is the dynasty is controlling what is now Afghanistan, parts of eastern Iran, Pakistan, Bangladesh, northern India. Yeah, but uh, unless I'm mistaken, if you come down India and you get through the southern half of India, you go over the Deccan Plateau, mm -hmm. and it seems that the Muslim invasion, when it occurred, it stopped there for some reason. Oh, well, okay. if you want to call this a Muslim invasion, well, I, would, I mean, it, we can talk about it from the Ghaznanites yeah, uh, and the Ghorians. Uh, we've got other people waiting, so give me just, let me just say this and we can talk about it later, because this is a great topic, but it can take days to answer. Um, everything takes days to answer. Um, so, India was ruled by Muslims. Most of India was ruled by Muslims long before the Mughals got there. And we call a series of dynasties the Delhi Sultans, <coughs> starting in about the 11th century. These are Turks and Afghans who have come in and established kingdoms in the north and end up ruling much of India. We also have a great deal of influence in the south coming from Iran, across the Arabian Sea, right, from the Persian Gulf. They're, they're importing horses like mad into the Deccan. Kingship in the south ends up being Shia, Muslim influenced by the Persians, except for some very small, you know, Vijayanagar, at one point, there was the last great Hindu kingdom in the Deccan. All of that becomes Shia kingships. So most of India is Muslim by this time. The population is, the rulership is, the kings are. So Mughal means this dynasty. It doesn't mean anything about greater Islam. It doesn't really have much to do with India. It's just a misunderstanding of this dynasty who identify themselves as Timurids, the descendants of Timur, Tamerlane, but who others consider Mughal. Well, okay. Professor, you, uh, there's an old saying that history is written by the winners. <laughs> and you keep talking about your boys, but let, let me tell you about my boys. <laughs> oh, you know more about your boys, too. <laughs> your boys came and conquered my boys. Okay. They slaughtered a lot of them. They stole a lot of them. And then you have the Babur Nama and the Akbar Nama, and that's the history that's written by the book. Sure. You go down, and the Hindu civilization was there for 5,000 years. Okay. The Muslim civilization is about 1,000 or 1,200 years old. So and they're conquerors. And you really ought to yeah. stop by, and instead, you 
romanticize the mortal rule. That's wonderful. But you should start by and talk to the Hindus and see what they went through. Thank you. Okay, let me just add this. I teach the history of India in my classes. So the Mughals take up about 5% of that class. They are conquerors, you're absolutely right. Um, they are not the first Muslim conquerors of India and they won't be the last conquerors. The one thing I will say in their defense, well, they won't be the last because they're followed by the British. And the problem with the British is that everything they steal from India goes to England. The Mughals keep it all in India. So the economy is not as devastating. We don't have a post-colonial economy in the post-Mughal world. I, I understand your point exactly. Hindu, uh, India is critically important. And of course, I know we want to call it Hindu when we go back too far. Vedic India, Bra Brahmanic India. Um, I work on those things as well. My interest is in this dynasty because of their memoirs and because of their Turco Mongol identity in India. But you don't have to look at it. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand your point. You're quite right. They're a, they're a moment of time in the vast history of South Asia. Um, they happen to be the moment of time I'm interested in. They've done a lot of very bad things. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Fowler and Lillard. And if you guys have more questions, you can buy one of her books, and while she's signing it, you can ask her. <laughs> <laughs>